Okay. 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 Everybody. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Closer. Like this. Okay. Okay. Everyone, I'll start because it's a long day. <laughs> We're almost done. So let me introduce myself first. I'm. Um, Natalie Rosenzweig, and uh, my teaching partner, Michel da Costa Gonzalez, is, is unfortunately not here today, but he has a good reason. This is Michel with me. He just started a new project in Paris, and it's due any day now, so he couldn't be here with me today. Uh, so he excuses himself, but um, we will uh, be teaching together this year. Michel and I are both partners at Rare Architecture, and I. Uh, we've been teaching Intermediate Unit 4 since uh, 2007 at the AA here. At Rare, we uh, recently uh, completed the Town Hall Hotel in Bethnal Green, which uh, some of you might know. Uh, this is the refurbishment of an old town hall uh, to which we added uh, this new extension with a laser-cut skin, uh, which was uh, parametrically devised uh, to accommodate the views and uh, sunlight and wind parameters around the site. Some photos here of the interiors where we kept the listed buildings and their rooms in shape so that um, the original proportions of the building would, be, would remain while inserting a contemporary uh, furniture into it and functions. Our work is also at the much smaller scale, similar to some of uh, the work that we do uh, here at the AA with our students. This was a screen that was uh, designed using CNC and the qualities of uh, plywood. And another project, uh, the chandelier that we designed, which was a mix of both uh, parametrically developed uh, length on a grid and highly uh, carefully crafted uh, beads in silicon. Some other projects recently that we're working on is a, a resort in the Arctic Circle with some igloos, as well as um, this high-rise residential tower in Singapore. Uh, a bar for a, uh, a pop-up bar for an, an exhibition. A shopping mall in Bangkok. Another resort that we're working on in uh, Thailand with very limited resources and uh, the project that is recently uh, going up in London now in Westminster, just a few meters from Buckingham Palace, uh, which is a residential development uh, that takes a contemporary take on the bow windows that we find around in the area and um, uh, sits, sits in the conservation area there. So Skyline, let me just, I just need to put my presenter here. So this year's uh, theme, as you know, is Skyline. <laughs> so to remove any doubt, first of all, we will not say what it, do what it says on the tin, and we will not be asking you to design a new Skyline as such. But we will use the notion to think of our experience in the city and how one designs with that in mind. So for most of you, when we say the word Skyline, you probably see this or this. But for us, Skyline can also mean this or this, but also this, and surprisingly this as well. For many people, a skyline looks like this, sometimes like that. Often this is what you see. Unfortunately, some, for some people, this is their skyline. For many people around the world, it's this. In London, it often looks like that. We will argue that this is a skyline as well. And for some people, um, the skyline is symbolized by this. And for others, it's rather that. Talking about London, of course. So skyline is a notion, a concept, that is a vehicle for us to discuss a number of crucial architectural issues. It is a notion from which we synthesize a city's morphology, but equally revealing its more intangible qualities, cultural, social and political notions that emerge or influence the built form. We will, we will make three important statements this year and three questions that are going to be asked through this. First of all, we will say that Skyline implies being part of a context. It is the singular understood as part of a whole. 
we will question how to participate in the historical and ongoing equilibrium between urban symbiotic and architectural objectification. In this drawing here, Federica illustrates the fragmented nature of urban experience, and thus the constant challenge of objectification, the making of objects rather than a context. This battle will always be between the architectural object that wants to stand out and the necessity of the greater organization, the context. The second question that we will ask is that the skyline questions a global vision versus immersion. What we mean is, how can we understand and act on the cities as machines through experiential and subjective instruments, putting the individual as a central figure of the context? In this drawing here, Carolina compressed her experience of a Parisian public space into a composition of synthetic new artifact, transforming the city into her personal immersion. We will tackle this unresolved tension between an architecture which is meant to be seen and the one that wants to be experienced. The th third argument is that skyline implies time. It is a transient condition. And we will question how to imagine realistic utopias of architectural artifacts, linking the imagined past to the perceived present. How can we instrumentalize time in a design process? Maria here, through this collage, attempted to collapse immemorial times and instances into one drawing, evoking the experience of a place over time. We will think of architecture as a transient discipline, not reduced to the frozen instant of a published image. The unit will argue that urban situations can be approached through a series of arbitrary linearities that students will search for and investigate. We will understand the city's spatial and behavioral accident through the user's experience rather than master planning. I will show you some images here of Henry's work his investigation and intervention in the Vatican is a sur surgical insertion of crafted views. His proposal considers the viewer's journey through a staged museum designed considering each step along the journey. In Eugene's project here, he looked at the city of Paris through its morphology as a perspectival device that he can manipulate to create his own experience. So we will question the balance between order and chance in generating development and various areas of the urban space. Dohun's work here on the arcade surrounding St. Peter in the Vatican tackles the boundary between public and privacy. He took the regulated order, which is disturbed by emerging niches, blurring the boundaries. So the notion of Skyline will be our guiding access to approach these questions. And we will mainly ask, when does Skyline become Skyline with a capital S? You will concentrate on developing arguments that define Skyline with this capital S as a proper noun, your architectural statement. As we define it, Skyline reads and expresses a compressed idea of an urban setting, illustrating the detachment between uses and built form. It is a vehicle through which a number of essential architectural issues gravitate. We argue that the architectural discipline needs a new set of tools to understand or more exactly accompany both the planned and the birthing urban growth, such as unruly building and fully accidental situations. So the favelas, for example, or on the very opposite, from Versailles to Pleasantville. Engaging in this year's unit is thinking through artifacts, the urban mechanics and modes of living attached to it. Our agenda is both visual, perceptive, and utopian, merging modes of conception and representation in one research. Showing all aspects that we attach to Skyline is engaging with the confrontation between control 
and a struggling or voluntary passive individual. So there are four topics that the Skyline enables us to discuss. And the first one, we group under, under the topic of scale. Cities, as you know, have always fought on the one hand for the per perfect postcard image, the symbolic figure, as Hong Kong here. While on the other hand, what we're seeing today is a much an acceleration, accelerating interiorization of the urban experiences. There are many more shopping malls and large expanses and, and podiums that the city dwellers experiences. And this challenges the understanding of the city as a perceivable whole. So the experience of scale is embedded in the consideration of skyline. From the vertical urge of New York to the accidental landscape of favelas, Skyline is the notion from which we first understand and synthesize a place. Our associate memory process brings up immediate images. So you will think of Hong Kong Bay viewed from Kowloon, or crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, or a pier ending with an opera. But these stereotypes, they don't necessarily translate the individuality of your subjective experience and impression of a city. The cities are not detached postcards, but also a full experience, a field of your personal immersion. As one moves through New York, the towers bend over, cutting a virtual and changing landscape that forces the perception of the whole. You see the sky's outline rather than individual buildings. And this is dynamic through the user's movement. Maria's recording here of her immersive views along a path in Hong Kong shows the experience of the skyline. It's a varied experience, more often associated with detachment as the perfect view from somewhere, but it can equally be immersive, static, or dynamic. And it talks about our perception of urbanity. So our investigations will lead us to question how we can think of the individual's experience through the definition of artificial horizons. In these drawings, Herikle here investigates the changing perspective of the street. She records her artificial horizon, horizon in this collapsed diagram. So the unit-specific representational tools of which, of which you've seen some examples now, and its ability to graphically master complexity will inform a cataloging of scales and times in exemplary urban situations. As Jazz Skyline here, her view of Montmartre in Paris from a window shows the various instances that can form a sequence drawing. This year, the unit will aim to find novel forms of architectural answers to tackle the scale and interconnectivity of dual vision. We will try to respond to both immersion and detachment simultaneously. And this definition of skyline will be approached through the question of perception and how space is read and represented. We're back to Henry's project here, where he tried to find the human perception at one particular point in the Church of Santa Statue in Rome. It's a great example here of a skyline that is planned from within. So it's this trompe l'oeil painting on the ceiling of the church. And what Henry studied and you experience when you're in the space is that the three-dimensional spatial volume is experienced from a particular zone. But as soon as you move, it's a different experience and a different image that you perceive. A second important aspect is that Skyline is collaborative. Now, what we mean by collaborative is that it opposes isolation. It works by essence only as part of a whole, of a context. So even when it's a self-referenced image, an architectural object, it ex exists only because it's differentiated or in opposition or exaggeration of its context. For a skyline to be, it requires this context. But when we say context, we mean both physical context and a context of time. Our tool will thus force us to understand the individual artifact as one in many, as part of an ongoing story. The skyline defies the notion of being unique, forcing for either coordination or exaggerated individuality, but it's always a response to something else, something already there. And this will be a bridge for us to also 
understand and study the collaborative nature of urban settings, the need to consider the context, and how often this happens or is defined in urban regulations and planning regulations of cities. So we have some examples of drawings here um, where you can see how these were translated into uh, a graphical chart. In Kien's drawing here, these are the New York planning regulations. Kai created a visual branching of the Parisian regulations, organizing rules and interdependencies, and then drawing the physical result of their application. So we're, whether existing through organic growth or controlled development, as in Paris, the skyline traces the particularities of a place. Could the, those particularities could be the topography, as in Rio, the topography of water in Venice, but it also responds to the climate of a particular situation in a particular condition. A third notion is that skyline is a political line. It's the trace of socio-political arrangements. So beyond the image attached to a guidebook, it's a key reading of politics and commercial forces alike. In Singapore, for example, there's a dynamic choreographed city balancing political will with commerce. The famous arrival from the airport is meant to impress the visitor and highlight the power of the city-state. The crafted image of Singapore, and here it's very much crafted, this is a collage by uh, Noel from two years ago in the unit, it imply, implies a strong planning determinism. On the other hand, you have the laissez-faire laissez of Dubai, which is the ground for an expression of a new economic power within an open terrain. And again, you can read these through the skyline. Back in time, the Seven Sisters in Moscow are the expression of an autocratic state through this imposing skyline. Seven of these were implemented around the city by Stalin to create this imposing skyline and a vision of power and overwhelming mass. These are not monuments anymore at this scale. And their symbol symbolic effect was so strong that copies were implement implemented in major Eastern capitals. So here in Warsaw, for example, and even in Astana in Kazakhstan. But that actually wasn't enough for the current ruler. And he needed to impose his own mark on the city. So he dotted the capital now with his new buildings of choice and defining objects for his signature skyline. So we, we know that design is often the sign of power and control. You place monuments and design cities in a way to, it's always been a way for leaders to leave their mark. This is a picture of Versailles in, on the outskirts of Paris and the, the, the Chateau of the Versailles, the Ca Versailles Castle was built by Louis XIV. And here everything was planned about the views in and out from a single point. The room is part of a scale of the city, and it's the base for a new coordinate system from which it, in one direction, you see the augmented reality of the garden with an infinite scenography and a view that's preserved to this day. So this was one interpretation of the skyline. And on the other side, by carefully placing his bedroom at the center, Louis XIV had the town of Versailles designed as a factual extension of his divine power. So his bedroom, by the way, is here in the middle, so he could look out onto the city. And these three avenues extend into the city while leaving a mark leading to the monarchy. This template of Versailles was deemed so successful that Washington DC continues this idea. This perspectival skyline embodies power and allegiance, and it was based on the model of Versailles because it was deemed to represent power for a new nation. So we're back to Paris again in the mid-19th century, and here you see Napoleon handing powers to Baron Haussmann for a redevelopment of the capital. This is a very important moment in the history of Paris since that's what shaped the city as you know it today. And the horizontality of Paris that we see is actually revealing of this older autocratic power of public centralism. 
to become what the city is today, it needed a very strong authoritarian regime to implement these changes. So as you see on these um, drawings here and photographs, the demolish, they, they demolished huge pieces of the medieval city to make way for a new cultural conformism. And the shape of the city physically embodies the symbol of power, not through isolated monuments, but as a perfect streetscape. And this at the scale of the city, not just the streets. Unless autocratic, autocratic but driven by economic forces, we can look at New York in the early 20th century, which embodies the competitiveness of a fast-growing young nation. Everyone pushes up here to show their power and wealth. And it has, the city offers this regulated grid, but it's a playboard that is defined, but the playboard plan is defined, but all can happen in three dimension. In very different times and technical abilities, San Gimignano in Italy has towers that equally reflect the town's medieval society and structure. In a sense, one could say beyond reasonable safety. It reflects the competitiveness of the local nobility and their will to physically represent and establish the power in the city. It's a basic expression of wealth and power at the scale of a small village. And this still exists today here with the Reliance Tower in, in Mumbai which belongs to one single family that hovers well above the fabric of the city. What we've seen in the previous examples are political power and economic power, but this is also true of religious power, of course. And closer to us here in London, the protected views of St. Paul's Cathedral determine the, land, the skyline of London because St. Paul has to remain visible from key points. So it's such looking at these levels of coordination or regulations be it physically traced or intangible in the built form, implies studying political lines. We will view the skyline as a political line, tracing a graph in time of societal and cu cultural tendencies. Finally, the last aspect that will interest us is that skyline is time. It's, it is seemingly both permanent and in constant evolution. So for us, it's a reflection on time. Once London was symbolized by this, Today, it's rather described by an image like this. The morphologies of cities are always evolving in a complex process, and the recording of the skyline is a way of tracing the evolution of a place. Whether this be highly, regul rela highly regulated as in Paris on the left, or as an extreme expression of organic growth over time with the favelas. Either model can only be understood through a staged and iterative understanding of time. The skyline is a dynamic fabrication and an evolving line. It will be for us an introduction to study the evolution of a place and observe what has been, what is, and what may become. In Fung's drawing here, he shows the effect of uh, his vision through a revolving door. So what you see is a collapse of uh, a revolution of a door in time with showing the various aspects of his um, reflection of the outdoor and the inner space. He decomposes this instant to collapse it back into a single drawing which describes his experience in time. So this will be our framework to work and think about considering time as a main component of a drawing as well as of design. This year, the unit has the ambition of inventing new tools to represent and generate architecture through time. We've tested some of these in the past through some of the student works. Kai here invented a camera to record the streetscape over a lapse of time, created, creating a very specific sensation in his, uh, in his photographs. And the result generated became a turn, a, in turn a tool to analyze and project his, in the city. We will continue our quest into urban, into urban growth, and this within the matured grounds. We will observe through the specific condition of the past, current, and future evolutions of the city. So this year, the unit will be working in Europe again, and our fields of exploration will be the tension between the old historic European city and emerging conditions. Paris and La Défense will be our prime test beds as they epitomize all the notions that we just discussed. As you see on this picture, you have this very strong contrast between the 
Paris, or the historical Paris, as I will call it now, and La Défense, the business district in its background. So pa Paris itself was developed as a, as a concentric growth of rings always growing out around the river um, and uh, destroying the medieval fabric, as we saw previously, uh, in the 19th century to create the city that we know today. It's an autocratic design, a strong image of a continuous urban fabric, which is characterized mainly by its strict horizontal line topping the city's horizon. It is one of the densest cities in Europe. You can see on this map how it, within the center there's very few red areas which represent the open space. And its antonym, its exact opposite, or as we called it, its fraternal twin, is La Défense. It's the business quarter at the west of the city. In a sense, one could say that La Défense is where everything is allowed to happen, where the present is taking shape. And at a first glance, you would tend to say that on the top is the 19th century, and on the bottom, the 21st century. But this is not exactly the case, and, and we will look into that. So La Défense was created in the late 1950s and is today Europe's largest purpose-built business district. It was developed through successive waves of building, and these mainly respond to the economic ups and downs. It is a pure product of modernist thinking with a clear separation of networks. The city is built on, a, on an artificial slab. The slab itself includes the networks of cars at different speeds and public transport with the platform above it on which the buildings and the public spaces take place. In a sense, it's this utopia made true. It's an impor important example of operational urbanism. And you can see here on this picture, the this artificial platform that entirely separates the pedestrian circulation from the vehicular one. It creates this vertical layering, and then the buildings are implemented onto the slab with on the top the pedestrian layer, which creates these vast public spaces. And it has recently become another playground for architects. Many of the projected towers have been the subject of international competitions and architectural stardom with Manuel Gautron, Morphosis, and the like. But of course, what is of interest to us is this, the contrast between the skyline of Paris and La Défense. And however disparate and different they seem, they're actually linked by the very strong historical axis, which you see in the center of this image. This, this historical axis runs from the Louvre on the left, on the right, sorry, in a straight line to La Défense. And along the way, it has a planned perspectival views that form the skyline of its own. It's perceived very much as a symbolic spinal cord of the city with main, major historical and contemporary buildings ending it at La Défense. And as we can see, the skyline of Paris is therefore dual. On the one hand, it's the flat museum city, which is constantly reinventing itself, in a dialogue with a contemporary vertical expression of power that feeds it. It is in Paris, and more precisely on the spinal axis, that our year's work will be concentrated. Linked by this axis, it's the Paris expressing the strong authoritarian control versus the one displaying private and commercial prowess that will interest us. And that's where you will be working. We believe that Paris embodies the four notions of skyline that will interest us. It questions the scale of the city, contrasting the ca caped historical city to the skyscrapers. It shows an ambivalent relationship to monumentality and strong regulatory environments. It is the result and ongoing ground of a political context and contest. And it is a great place to question time, both because it is the result of an evolution and because it seems that at least from the outside, the time, time has stopped and that contemporary development has been pushed outside. What you see on, on this slide here, this drawing, is uh, it records all the historical um, and political uh, implementations along this historical axis. So dating back to Henry V, Marie de Médicis, the different Louis, Napoleon, and up to recently François Mitterrand, the French president who established his own stamp on this line. 
And it's on this axis that we will ask you to leave a trace in history as well. So using this notion of skyline, the year will be organized through a sequence. What has been, what may be, and what shall become. Three chapters for three terms. In the first term of the year, we will explore urban and personal skylines through regulatory combinatorial mechanics and measures of subjectivities. You will start by thinking of spatial perception through the reverse engineering method. As we see here in Dahoon's um, work, he shows his decomposition of a perspectival <coughs> painting, and he tried to recreate the actual space of the painting. He decomposed it into its various components and variables in order to recompose the experience and reveal the various possibilities of views. So you, we will commence the year by the abstraction of urban space as an expression of the multitude perceived by the, in the individual, your personal skyline. Here again, Dahoon creates this device to measure interiority, taking the pulse of the city. This sphere-like device is a way for him to measure views, height, and in such wrapping the physical space that surrounds an, ob an object that he can look at. You will define your understanding of skyline, considering vision and immersion, these are examples of Maria's work in Paris and Hong Kong. And Justine looking at a smaller scale of the Johnson Museum, analyzing this mirror device from where she envisaged a dynamic perception. This enabled her to, precise, to develop precise geometrical understandings that were then applied later on in her project. You will then bring this understanding to Paris as we will travel to Paris in the first uh, term during open week and venture into the Parisian urbanity. There we will look through the accidents within the plant and observe the evolving typologies. In Carolina's work here, we see how she compressed the experience of a Parisian public space, composing it into a synthetic new artifact. And transforming the city into her personal immersion. Throughout the term, we will first illustrate a systematic understanding of political, societal, and formal variables for both organic and planned urban growth. We will form the unit's catalog of precedents. We will organize and understand the variables at play. And this understanding will be translated into a parametric system in order to become a tool for translating and manipulating later on. Gwen's work here shows his manipulation of a parametric model where a single wall and its dependencies are modified and change the internal layouts. What seems quite um, light in terms of just changing the layouts is actually changing the societal way in, that um, the bourgeois Parisian family would live and inhabit these interiors. We will have a parametric modeling workshop with the Dennis Latches from uh, Grimshaw's office towards the end of the first term. And we will aim to understand the skyline as a system, a set of variables that influence one another and have the potential to create multiple results. As in the drawing by Yvonne here, you see the implication of this into the round plan uh, principle of Adolf Floss and the creation of new spatial entities. This will arm us for the TS, for which we will ask students to define their brief at the end of the term. And I will come back to the TS in a moment. The second term will be centered on individual proposals tracing where physical space and experiential moments meet, what may be. We will expand our mapping of time and tackle the two ages of Paris, the two utopias. We will travel to Paris again and define our sites and re record these through intensive mappings. Students will choose a site on the historical axis on the basis of which they will f further represent the past and the present at their chosen scale. I'll quickly run through an, an, some examples of uh, mappings and how uh, this could emerge in the unit. Showing here the mapping of Singapore by Hawen, creating a point system that har harnesses future developments. We will also have a workshop with Dana Berman, who worked for Foster's Urban Studies Group and now heads the research unit at UN Studio. And she will introduce us to methods of urban analysis, considering the many factors at play. We will, as such, develop a range of mapping, such as tracing nodes, noise, or virtual barriers recording the views. 
We will also consider environmental inputs and geometries. And we'll develop techniques for mapping to thick drawings and models, of course. We will understand the scale of the urban and that object within it. And when one thinks of time, animations and the media of cinema will be one of our key references. So we will hold workshops dedicated to animated representation and experience in time and learn from cinema how to draw time, what tools we can use to render the dynamic and aesthetic medium. These are some examples here of Alexei's work a few years ago. So moving from the static representation of sociomorphologies through time, the new sequence will consider dynamic reading in the traveling guide of architecture's grand perspective. At the end of the second term, we will travel to Singapore as a study trip. The city-state, as I described before, shows the role of architecture in the planification of an image. It started less than a century ago with something that looked like this to develop to develop today into the striking skyline. In a sense, in parallel to what Paris tried to do in the 19th century, Singapore does today, although with a very different result. The skyline is worth having a pool on top of it. In Singapore, we will look at some of um, architects, uh, signature architects' work, defining the skyline here, Daniel Liebeskind, Zaha Hadid, or OMAs. In the third term, we will be organized around the topic of what shall become. By definition, we expect to be surprised by the students' personal investigations. You will foresee what shall become of the historical access between old and new, seen from your chosen local site. You will be asked to continue your time-based representation of a place and to complete, complete the tension between Paris and La Défense. Your projects will question the topics that we've put forward and how to think of the object within a contextual and collaborative setting and engage with political and economic realities. But above all, you will develop representational tools that evoke time as an inherent element of architectural thinking and a process to create architecture. We will not differentiate between method and result. In Daniel's work here, you can see how the recording of his transition between private and public space developed a method for design extracting moments into three-dimensional experiences of space. And James devised a method, a, a hybrid type of drawing, whereby the folds configure the historical era of a building through its architectural ornaments. This then became a strategy to propose an envelope that bridges historical styles and was referred to in the interior as well, bridging traditional proportions with contemporary inputs. Gleb produced a system of layers to describe various views of the Persian fabric. And this system, again, developed into a model with first into physical layers and then developed into a tool for imagining new immersive experiences in Hong Kong, a peer for a controlled visual approach to the city. We will question no notions of, uncontrolled un un of controlled unpredictability. Individual arguments and design proposals will be re-evaluated for the potential to enrich the urban system with a new temporal input. Frangiscos here considered this at the scale of the building, mirroring walls and thus creating a new set of interiors. And Dionysus looked at the very minute details that show the passing of time in what from the outside is a very regulated system and the discrepancies in, inside to reflect upon residential typologies. This was also for him, um, time was the main uh, material factor in his work. He devised this facade system with materials and structures that enable a controlled decay. Through the model here, he considered the changes in the functional uses as the building would decay over time. I'll quickly finish with technical studies, which for us this year will be centered around the notion of the idea of time and how we can define time through um, technicalities with three main axes. Uh, either structural, thinking of the structurally, how a structural component ages over time or ha has been defined in, through history. Calvin's work here shows how we work both as drawings, models, and testing these, but also physical models at one-to-one -one scale, and the environmental impact of these. Dionysius's work here was testing materials and their decay, as we've seen recently. 
this is another branch that we will be interested in looking at. And finally, the third branch or option for ATS will be a phenomenological approach in Kai's work here where he devised this camera to record time in his street and develop this optical device that enabled him to see the city the same way that it looked through the photograph. As always, we'll have unit conversations throughout the year where we will get together and in, inform on the unit's agenda as a whole. We will be reading together. We'll have workshops and seminars, as I've stated before. And uh, this is it. <laughs> Thanks.